Hello and welcome to Cogito Ergo Pod, the podcast that looks at the theological, mythological, philosophical and esoteric, but in a way that's hopefully makes it fun and accessible. My name is Daniel, and in this episode we are going to lose ourselves in the heat and sand of ancient Egypt and explore the life of Pharaoh Akhenaten and his efforts to bring about a total religious revolution in the form of Atenism. We will look at who Akhenaten was and how he fits into the history of ancient Egypt. Then we will delve into what he was trying to achieve by throwing out the old gods and goddesses, replacing them with the Aten or the Sun Disk. What happened during this time and the fallout after Akhenaten's death are extraordinary even by modern standards. I found while doing the research for this episode that there is a lot of info on Akhenaten, but not much on Atenism itself. So try to understand when I don't have all the answers for you for all the questions that you may have by the end of the episode. I'm also steering clear of any discussions about the art of the period. It is worth looking up, but there are only so many ancient aliens conspiracy theories which I can handle at one time. Now it's time to saddle up your camel. We are going in. Akhenaten, meaning effective for the Aten, was an ancient Egyptian pharaoh reigning from 1353 to 1336 BCE or 1351 to 1334 BCE. He was the 10th ruler of the 18th dynasty which reigned from 1550 to 1292 BCE. Before the fifth year of his reign he was known as Amenhotep IV meaning Amun is satisfied. The future Akhenaten was born Amenhotep a young son of Pharaoh Amenhotep III and his principal wife Tai. We have no date for when Akhenaten was born or a place of birth. Donald B. Redford dates his birth before his father Amenhotep III's 25th regal year, roughly 1363 to 1361 BCE. The only mention of his name as the king's son Amenhotep was found on a wine docket at Amenhotep III's Malkata Palace, where some historians suggested Akhenaten was born. Others contend he was born in Memphis. Akhenaten had an elder brother, Crown Prince Tutmos, who was recognized as Amenhotep III's heir. He also had four or five sisters, Sitamun, Henutaneb, Iset, Nebeta, and possibly Beketaten. Tutmos's early death perhaps around Amenhotep III's 13th renal year, meant that Akhenaten was next in line for Egypt's throne. Egyptologist Cyril Aldred suggests that Prince Amenhotep might have been a high priest of Ptah in Memphis, although no evidence supporting this has been found. It is known that Amenhotep's brother, Crown Prince Tutmos, served in this role before he died. If Amenhotep inherited all his brother's roles in preparation for his ascension to the throne, he might have become a high priest in Tutmos's stead. Aldred proposes that Akhenaten's unusual artistic inclinations might have been formed during this time, serving Ptah, the patron god of craftsmen, whose high priests were sometimes referred to as the greatest of the directors of craftsmanship. Akhenaten married the noble woman Nefertiti about the time he became pharaoh in 1353 BCE. Egyptologist Dimitri Lebery suggests that the marriage took place in Akhenaten's fourth renal year. Nefertiti was a powerful queen who helped Akhenaten transform the Egyptian religious landscape. Together they had at least six daughters. Although it is unclear whether Akhenaten's son Tutankhamun was also Nefertiti's, the young prince became the most famous pharaoh of all, Tutankhamun. The secondary wife of Akhenaten named Kia is also known from inscriptions. Some Egyptologists theorize that she gained her importance as the mother of Tutankhamun. Some other historians such as Edward Went and James Allen have proposed that Akhenaten took some of his daughters as wives or consorts to father a male heir. While this is debated, some historical parallels exist. Akhenaten's father Amenhotep III married his daughter Sitamun, while Ramesses II married two or more of his daughters, even though their marriages might simply have been ceremonial. Akhenaten took Egypt's throne as Amenhotep IV, most likely in 1353 or 1351 BCE. It is unknown how old Amenhotep IV was when he did this, 
estimates range from 10 to 23. He was most likely crowned in Thebes. The beginning of Amenhotep IV's reign followed established pharaonic traditions. He did not immediately start redirecting worship towards the Aten and distancing himself from the other gods. Egyptologist Donald B. Redford believes this implies that Amenhotep IV's eventual religious policies were not conceived of before his reign, and he did not follow a pre-established plan or program. Redford points to three pieces of evidence to support this. First, surviving inscriptions show Amenhotep IV worshipping several different gods, including Atom, Osiris, Anubis, Nekbet, Hathor, and the Eye of Ra, and texts from this era refer to the gods and every god and goddess. The high priest of Amun was also still active in the fourth year of Amenhotep IV's reign. Second, even though he later moved his capital from Thebes to Akhetaten, his initial royal titulary honoured Thebes. His nomen was Amenhotep, god ruler of Thebes, and recognising its importance, he called the city Southern Heliopolis, the first great seat of Ra or the Disk. Third, Amenhotep IV did not yet destroy temples to the other gods, and he even continued his father's construction projects at Karnat's precinct of Amun-Ra. He decorated the walls of the precinct's third pylon with images of himself worshipping Ra, portrayed in the god's traditional form of a falcon-headed man. While continuing the worship of other gods, Amenhotep IV's initial building program sought to build new places of worship to the Aten. He ordered the construction of temples and shrines to the Aten in several cities across the country, such as Bubastis, Tel Elborg, Heliopolis, Memphis, Nekin, Kawa, and Kerma. He also ordered the construction of, large temple, of a large temple complex dedicated to the Aten at Karnak in Thebes, northeast of the parts of the Karnak complex dedicated to Amun. The Aten temple complex, collectively known as Per Aten, House of the Aten, consisted of several temples whose names survive. Around Rainal year 2 or 3, Amenhotep IV organised a said festival. Said festivals were ritual rejuvenations of an ageing pharaoh, which usually took place in the, fir the first time around the 13th year of a pharaoh's reign, and every three or so years thereafter. Egyptologists only speculate as to why Amenhotep IV organised a said festival when he was likely still in his early 20s. Regardless of the celebration's aim, Egyptologists believe that during the festivities, Amenhotep I only made offerings to the Aten rather than the many other gods and goddesses, as was customary. Among the last documents that refer to Akhenaten as Amenhotep IV are two copies of a letter to the pharaoh from Ippi, the high steward of Memphis. These letters, found in Gurob, and informing the pharaoh that the royal estates in Memphis were in good order and the temple of Ptah is prosperous and flourishing, are dated to Reynal Year 5, day 19 of the growing season's third month. About a month later, day 13 of the growing season's fourth month, one of the boundary stela at Akhetaten already had the name Akhenaten carved on it, implying that the pharaoh changed his name between the two inscriptions. Amenhotep IV changed his royal title to show his devotion to the Aten. No longer would he be known as Amenhotep IV and be associated with the god Amun, but rather he would completely shift his focus to the Aten. With a new name came new policies towards religious worship. Akhenaten instructed that temples which were dedicated to Amun should be vandalised, as well as many figures depicting gods and goddesses other than Aten. Around the same time, he changed his royal titulary on the 13th day of the growing season's fourth month. Akhenaten decreed that a new capital would be built, Akhentatet, ancient Egyptian meaning horizon of the Aten, better known today as Amarna. The events Egyptologists know the most about during Akhenaten's life are connected with the founding of Akhetaten, as several so-called boundary stelae were found around the city to mark its boundary. The pharaoh chose a site about halfway between Thebes, the capital at the time, and Memphis on the east bank of the Nile. Historians do not know for certain why Akhenaten established a new capital and left Thebes, the old capital. 
The boundary steel I detail Akhenaten's founding is damaged, where it likely explains the pharaoh's motives for the move. Surviving parts claim what happened to Akhenaten, alluding to offensive speech against the Aten. Egyptologists believe that Akhenaten could be referring to conflict with the priesthood and followers of Amun, the patron god of Thebes. The great temple of Amun, such as Karnak, were all located in Thebes and the priests there achieved significant power early in the 18th dynasty, especially under Hapshepsut and Tutmos III, thanks to pharaohs offering large amounts of Egypt's growing wealth to the cult of Amun. The city was built quickly, thanks to a new construction method that used substantially smaller building blocks than under previous pharaohs. By reignal year 8, Akhetaten reached a state where it would be occupied by the royal family. Only his most loyal subjects followed Akhenaten and his family to the new city. While the city continued to be built, in the years 5 through 8, construction work began to stop in Thebes. Eventually the pharaoh would claim that he was the only son of Aten and that he was his messenger. Such a declaration would make the priests redundant, especially those who were members of the powerful Amun priesthood. Egyptologists know little about the last five years of Akhenaten's reign, beginning in 1341 or 1339 BCE. These years were poorly attested and only a few pieces of contemporary evidence survive. The lack of clarity makes reconstructing the latter part of the pharaoh's reign a daunting task and a controversial and contested topic of discussion among Egyptologists. Among the newest pieces of evidence is an inscription discovered in 2012 at a limestone quarry at Deir el Bersha, just north of Akentaten, from the pharaoh's 16th reignal year. The text refers to the building project of Amarna and establishes that Akhenaten and Nefertiti were still a royal couple just a year before Akhenaten's death. The inscription is dated to year 16, month 3 of Akhet, day 15 of the reign of Akhenaten. Following year 12, Egyptologists proposed that Egypt was struck by an epidemic, most likely a plague. Contemporary evidence suggests that a plague ravaged through the Middle East during this time, and ambassadors and delegations arriving to Akhenaten's year 12 reception might have brought the disease to Egypt. Alternatively, letters from the Hattians might suggest that the epidemic originated in Egypt and was carried through the Middle East by Egyptian prisoners of war. Regardless of its origin, the epidemic might account for several deaths in the royal family that occurred in the last five years of Akhenaten's reign. Akhenaten might have ruled together with Smenkare, his son-in-law and future pharaoh, and Nefertiti for several years before his death. Based on depictions and artifacts from the tombs of Mere II and Tutankhamun, Smenkare would have been Akhenaten's co-regent by renal year 13 or 14, but died a year or two later. Nefertiti might not have assumed the role of co-regent until after year 16, when a stealer still mentions her as Akhenaten's great royal wife. Egyptologist Aidan Dodson proposes that both Smenkare and Nefertiti were Akhenaten's co-regents to ensure that the Amarna family continued rule when Egypt was confronted with an epidemic. Dodson suggests that the two were chosen to rule as Akhenaten's co-regent in case Akhenaten died and Tutan Tutankhamun took the throne at a young age, or rule in Tutankhamun's stead if the prince also died in the epidemic. Akhenaten died after 17 years of rule and was initially buried in a tomb in the royal Wada east of Akhetaten. The order to construct the tomb and to bury the pharaoh there was commemorated on one of the boundary stela delineating the capital's borders. Let a tomb be made for me in the eastern mountain of Akhetaten. Let my burial be made in it, in the millions of jubilees which the Aten, my father, decreed for me. In the years following the burial, Akhenaten's sarcophagus was destroyed and left in the Akhetaten necropolis. Reconstructed in the 20th century, it is in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo as of 2019. Despite leaving the sarcophagus behind, Akhenaten's mummy was removed from the royal tombs after Tutankhamun abandoned Akhetaten and returned to Thebes. It was most likely moved to tomb KV-55 in the Valley of the King near Thebes. This tomb was later desecrated. 
likely during the Ramesseid period. Now, for Akhenaten, the worship of the Aten was not just something he and his family were to do. It was intended that the whole of Egypt should totally overhaul their belief system. However, what was Akhenaten proposing? What was Aten and why was its worship so vital to the Pharaoh that he should move Egypt away from polytheism, the worship of many gods and goddesses, to make up something that no one, it would seem, had ever tried before? Monotheism, the worship of only one god or goddess. Let's find out. Atonism, also known as the Aten religion, the Amana religion, and the Amana heresy, is a religion that is typically described as monotheistic monolatristic, although some Egyptologists argue that it was actually henotheistic. Monolatristic worship, or monolatry, is the belief that there are many gods and goddesses, however the focus of consistent worship falls on one particular deity in the pantheon. However, henotheistic worship, or henotheism, is the worship of one supreme god that does not deny the existence of other deities. Basically, Monolatry is picking your favourite divine being to worship, while knowing others exists. And henotheism is the religious equivalent of don't ask, don't tell, with regards to other possible gods to worship. Atonism was centred on the cult of Aten, a god depicted as the disc of the sun. Aten was originally an aspect of Ra, Egypt's traditional solar deity. The sun disc that would appear above Ra's head was the Aten. The word Aten itself means circle or disc is first found in the 24th century BCE, as the sun disc was merely one aspect of the sun god Ra. It was a relatively obscure sun god, and without the Atenist period, it would barely have figured in Egyptian history. Some, such as Eric Hornung, consider that Aten was not actually the disc, but rather the light which emanated from it. Although there are indications that it was probably slightly more important during the 18th dynasty, notably Amenhotep III's naming of his royal barge as Spirit of the Aten, it was Amenhotep IV who introduced the Atenist revolution in a series of steps culminating in the official installation of the Aten as Egypt's sole god. Although each line of kings prior to the reign of Akhenaten had previously adopted one deity as the royal patron and supreme state god, there had never been an attempt to exclude other deities, and the multitude of gods had always been tolerated and worshipped. During the reign of Tutmosis IV, it was identified as a distinct solar god, and his son, Amenhotep IV, established and promoted a separate cult for the Aten. However, there is no evidence that Amenhotep neglected the other gods or attempted to promote the Aten as an exclusive deity. In the ninth year of his reign, Akhenaten declared a more radical version of his new religion, declaring the Aten not merely the supreme god of the Egyptian pantheon, but the only god of Egypt, with himself as the sole intermediary between the Aten and the Egyptian people. Key features of Atenism include a ban on idols and other images of the Aten, with the exception of a rayed solar disc in which the rays, commonly depicted ending in hands, appear to represent the unseen spirit of Aten. Aten was addressed by Akhenaten in prayers, such as the great hymn to Aten, which goes, O soul God, beside whom there is none. Aten's name is also written differently after the ninth year of the pharaoh's rule to emphasize the radicalism of the new regime. Aten, instead of being written with the symbol of a raid solar disc, now became spelled phonetically. Details of Atenism theology are still unclear. Aten is considered to have been very distant, almost unreachable. It was also a universal force rather than one that was focused on a particular area of life or the universe. Divine revelation or statue, statue worship were not part of Atenism, and so the population had no focus for their worship like they would in traditional Egyptian temples. Also, as Akhenaten referred to himself as being the son of Aten, he would claim that he was the only conduit through which Aten could be reached. Therefore, the focus of worship did not have to be the Aten, but the pharaoh and his family. It is almost as if it was a cult of personality through Akhenaten's personal divine connection with the one true God. The exclusion of all but one God and the 
prohibition of idols was a radical departure from the previous Egyptian tradition. Because of the monolatry or monotheistic character of, the, of Atonism, a link to Judaism or other monotheistic religions has been suggested by various writers. For example, psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud assumed Akhenaten to be the pioneer of monotheistic religion and Moses as Akhenaten's follower in his book Moses and Monotheism. Extraordinary to think that the Israelites leaving Egypt in Exodus were in fact Atonists fleeing persecution. But this is all from a man who had a thing about daddy issues on white horses. The modern Druze, an Arab-speaking esoteric ethno-religious group, regard their religion as being descended from and influenced by older monotheistic and mystic movements, including Atonism. In particular, they attribute the Tawit's first public declaration to Akhenaten. So for now, we need to leave the heat of Egypt behind us. What Amenhotep IV Akhenaten did during his reign is considered by some to be the start of a new way of thinking about theology and religion, whether it was monotheism, monolatry, or henotheism. What was done here was something that would eventually be a template which some of the best known world religions would adopt, a one God-centric worship. The efforts after his rule to erase him from the history records go to show how dangerous Akhenaten's religious reforms were considered. If it hadn't been for the discovery of Akentatet, now known as Amarna, in the 19th century, it's quite possible that this revolutionary pharaoh would have gone unnoticed. Imagine being so feared that your existence must be removed to maybe stop it all happening again. Lucky for them, monotheism never caught on. Oh wait. Well, there you have it. Thank you all for listening. If you could take the time on your podcast provider to click follow, leave a comment, click the download button, that'd be fantastic. Go over to our Instagram page at cogito underscore ergo underscore pod. Give us a follow there. You'll also find if you search for us on YouTube, we have all our episodes that we that we upload after we've gone live on the streaming services. So you can follow us there, you can like us there, and you can share them wherever you like. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening, and I'll catch you again next time. Mm -hmm.